Section 2.2 .2 is bar graphs. So we're going to look at bar graphs um, and how they, how they work instead of line graphs, which we looked at last time. So bar graph is a different way, another way to visually represent the data. And a bar graph is used to, to plot discrete data. So discrete data means that you have no, um, it, not everything is included. It couldn't be like 0 0.555523. It's got to be something that's discrete that, that um, has definite values and that's it. Um, they use rectangular bars. Uh, as it says, discrete data is data that can only have certain distinct numbers, like certain distinct values. Like the number of students in your class or something like that. The number of hairs on your head, the number of babies in a you know baby ward or something like that. Um, okay, let's look at an example here. So here we have, in 2001, the Canadian census data was listed and the, the following approximate populations of various cities. So they have Vancouver, Calgary, Victoria, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Regina. Uh, they don't have Kamloops on here. I want to add Kamloops because it's never, ever added. <laughs> All right. So we have the cities there along the top and the population in thousands. Wow, look at that. 1,987,000. That's 1 1.9 million. 951,000. Well, I can tell you Kamloops right now is somewhere between 80 and 90,000. So here we have all the, the populations of cities. So it wants you to display the data on a bar graph. So we have all this data, uh, Vancouver, Calgary, Victoria, all those value, all those cities are going to go along the bottom. I can tell you that right now. I'll show you below. But the cities go along the bottom, <clears throat> and the population goes up this way. Okay. And typically what you want to do is you want to start at zero, and you want to go up to your maximum value, which would be around 2,000 round off don't make it exactly <clears throat> and then when you do that you want to make sure that your jumps are appropriate am i going to jump in terms of thousands and we go zero no i want a little more than that right well let's see there's 200 close to 200 400 that one's 300 so maybe we could go up in jumps of 200 let's see what they do on their graph okay so they went up in jumps of 500 um, and then they kind of estimate where the data would be. So for Vancouver, it's going to be almost right at the top. It's got the largest uh, amount. Now this is taking to a, into account Greater Vancouver, I, I would imagine. Um, Calgary is there, Victoria is there, and notice you can kind of guess what the population would be for Calgary. It'd be a little less than a thousand, but quite a lot more than 500, right? So it's not exact. They're not exact values. So taking your data, rounding stuff off for your, for your um, scale, and then drawing the bar graphs that are separated by spaces. Bar graphs are always separated by spaces. And there's the data. All right, the next example, again, this is on page 84 of your workbook. All the stuff that I'm going through for this chapter is in your workbook, if you want to follow along. Carbon dioxide, so CO2 emissions, contribute to climate change. And so they are closely monitored by governments and environmental groups. So they, wanted, they want the data and they want to be able to see it. So the following two graphs represent CO2 emissions worldwide from 1995 to 2005. So they have the data, the years along the side. And these are a horizontal bar graph. What we saw before was a vertical bar graph. Verticals up and down. You can have two, those two different types. But bar graphs are always have spaces in between. So what are the questions based on this? Which graph is a better representation of the CO2 emissions? The first one or the second one? Which one do you think? Well, it's actually the second one because you can see the data more clearly. It's more clear. Um, the reason for that is if you look at this graph here, I can't really tell. They all kind of look the same. This graph here I can really tell because of the scale on the bottom, because it's better, it's divvied up more than just 0, 10, 20. It's actually got um, 20, 21.5, 23.0, 24. So each line, like they're missing that line there, that line there, each one is going up by 0 0.75. Or it's adding on another 0 0.75. So this would be like 22.25. And then 23.75, and so on. So it's going up by 0.75s each time. Um, 
Next question, what were the emissions in 1999? So I go over to 1999. It's almost 23.75. So let's say maybe 23.6, 23.5. Again, it's a little bit of a guess, um, but those are the, that's how you kind of uh, guess the data. And then what were they in 2005, which is up here, 2005. So I go across almost 27.5. It's definitely more than 26.75. So let's say it's maybe 27.25, something like that. So it's just a matter of looking at the graph. See, this one is much more difficult. If I was to do that with the first graph, it would be impossible, nearly. I'd have to say, well, it's somewhere between 20 and 30. This one here is 25. So it's a little bit more than 25. You're just, your guessing is less accurate, far less accurate. Oh, sorry. Why might the more misleading graph be used to represent the data? Oops. You would probably use the first graph that's listed up there to minimize the impact. To say, oh, it wasn't that bad. I mean, it's not that much worse in 2005 than it was in 1995. Look, it's just a little bit more. But if you look at the scale, you got to see, oh, well, it's actually going up by pretty big jumps. Whereas this one, you can see right away, oh my goodness, it's way worse than it was in 2000 or 1995. I mean, on the other hand, on the other side, to play to play the devil's advocate, you could say they were using this one to make it look even worse than it actually is. They could do that too. They could make the data along the bottom um, in smaller increments to make it look like it's way worse. Oh no, look, look how terrible we are now. So either one can be misleading depending on what they're trying to do. But in this case, I think it's better to use this graph because you're talking about billions of tons, which is a lot. And if you're going in jumps of 5 billion tons, that's a lot. So you probably want to make sure that your scale is more uh, is smaller. All right. So new skills working with different representations of data. So some data can be uh, represented using either a vertical bar graph or a horizontal bar graph. Um, and it could also be used a broken line graph. So we have three. You got your vertical bar graph, horizontal bar, gra bar graph, and the broken line graph. So here we have some data. Table shows approximate populations of moose jaw, uh, moose jaw Saskatchewan from 1980 to 2005. So we have all this data, 33.5, 34.3, um, and it wants you to display the data on both a horizontal and vertical bar graph, both, two different graphs. Then it wants you to answer the question, what is the better representation? Let's go down and see um, all these questions kind of answered. So you want you to draw a broken line graph, uh, and then answer questions about that. And then the lastly, it wants you to draw a vertical bar graph using the same scales uh, and starting points. So we'll see how they do this. So first of all, here's the solution. They drew a horizontal and a vertical. And you're supposed to say, which one looks better? Well, I would say this one here, and it says part B. The vertical graph looks better, is a better representation because you can see the population trends. You can see it going up and down and kind of going down more. This one is a little more difficult. It's, it's kind of confusing. Typically, you should have the years, the time should almost typically go along the bottom. It's better. Um, part C says the population trend shows a slight decline in population over the years. It looks like it's basically kind of sloping down, right? The, the, the population is going down. Nextly, next what they do is they, they graph a broken line graph. So they have from 1980 to 2005. And it looks pretty good. Uh, it looks almost exactly like the bar graph up there, all they're doing is they're taking the points and connecting the dots, right? So the data is actually represented quite well by the broken line graph as well. And lastly, they want you to draw the broken line graph uh, using the scale here and the vertical bar graph, which is here. Um, the bar graph does seem to be not quite as misleading as the first one because you can kind of see the data more accurately, especially with the rectangles. Um, it kind of appears a little more accurate, whereas the first one looks like, oh, big, big jump, and then what's this going on here? Um, it's good, it still represents the data, but the second one can be, uh, is probably a little better for representing the data. All right, lastly, what I wanna do is look at double bar graphs. So double bar graphs just make, uh, they have two bars side by side, and they're representing two pieces of data. So here we have resale homes, which are homes that you bought already and now you're selling them again. Like I'm the owner of a home, I would sell my home. New homes is when you're selling like the person that builds the home themselves, then they're going to sell it. Brand new home, nobody's ever lived in it. 
And then there's some questions based on this. What is the average price of a new single home in 2005? And we're looking at new homes, which is the light gray color. So you always, always, always need a, uh, a legend to these types of graphs because otherwise you don't know which one is which. So in 2005, the new homes are worth approximately, and they even have the number at the top, which is really good. That's the best way to do these graphs is to put your number at the top. And there's no guessing. You have the good uh, representation of data, plus you're extremely accurate because you give the value. So we can see right there, the average house price was about $240,000. Remember, these are in thousands of dollars. Um, between what years was there a drop in the resale single family? So we're looking at the black. And we're trying to see when there was a drop. Well, it went up, 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 way up, up quite a bit more. Oh, look, it dropped down there and it dropped down again there for the black one. So I would say between 2007 and 2009. Oh, that's the wrong answer. The one above. So between 2007 and 2009, there was a drop in resale home value. And then it says, what is the general trend in differences in prices, which cost more or less, of the two types of units? In which years was this not so? So typically we can see that the resale homes are worth less than the new homes, almost always, except for, as you can see, 2006, the resale homes were worth more. 2007, they were also worth more. So resale homes are worth less than new homes, with the exception of 2006 and 2007, where resale homes were actually worth more than new homes, which is kind of, which is kind of weird, but that's good to know. Because then you can see, oh, when would be a good time for me to sell my house? when they're worth more, right? Of course, because then you're going to be moving into something better, but you're going to be paying less. So that's a good representation of data for double bar graphs and how they work. Uh, again, these are goes over the whole section. The answers are there at the bottom. Um, if you get stuck, again, just go back, watch the video, and um, hope you do well.